the things you notice as you practice is how many selves you have. And often it turns out that you have more than you, than you notice. For every desire that you take on, there's going to be the sense of what you can do to bring that desire about, what powers you have under your control, and then the sense of you as the person who's going to experience the happiness that's going to come when that desire is fulfilled. The desire, the craving, and the Buddha said, is the is the water that seeds. Excuse me, the water that nourishes our sense of self. It's what provides the location around which this sense of self develops. And that goes for each desire we have. Sometimes we have desire for food, sometimes we have desire for shelter, for friends, for relationships, for all kinds of things. And we have a, des we have a sense of self for each of those desires. And especially when we suffer loss of something we thought we had, or something we did have for a while. but wasn't really as much ours as we thought it was. It's not just the loss of that thing or that relationship. It's a strong sense that we've lost part of ourself, one of ourselves. And it's very central to the Buddhist teachings on suffering. This is one of the main causes for suffering. And it goes deep. There's a story where King Basanity was talking to the Buddha. And one of the workers in the palace came to him and whispered in his ear and said, Queen Malika had just died. So the king breaks down and cries. And so the Buddha says to him, well, did you ever think that she would live forever? How can we have that in this world? But the things that we love don't pass. The people we love don't pass. But then he goes on to say to the king, as long as you feel that there's a value in giving expression to your grief, go ahead. But there will come a point when you realize that it's self-indulgence. In the king's case, he said, you have to realize that there are other desires you have in life and you can't abandon those just to keep on giving expression to your grief, the other desires that you have to work on, the other desires that you have to fulfill. In other words, the other parts of yourself or other selves that have to keep functioning. And that's where that first comment of his comes in, it, to remind the king it's not just him, but it's universal. This is one of the bizarre things about, about grief. You would think that thinking of the grief experienced by everybody in the world would make your own grief even heavier, but it doesn't. It takes a lot of the sting out of it, as you realize well, it's not just me. It's built into the way things are. And that reflection we often have, I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. That's actually only part of the reflection given in the canon. That part of the f reflection is for the purpose of reminding you that you have to be skillful in what you do, skillful in the desires that you foster, choosing which ones to foster, which ones to put aside. But then the Buddha encourages you to go on and think, it's, it's not just me, it's everybody, man, woman, and child, lay person ordained. Now in the past and in the future. Everybody is going to grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to them. And as the Buddha said, that gives you a different motivation. It's a motivation to get on the path.
In other words, you develop a new self, the self that really does want to find a way out of all of this turmoil, all of this repeated suffering. The emotion here is sangwega. In another, another context, he calls it a renunciate grief, as opposed to householder grief. Householder grief is when you don't get what you want in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas, which sounds pretty abstract, but it includes relationships and our dealings with the world as a whole, because that's what the world is. It's the experience of the six senses. And the cure, he says, for that grief is not trying to find happiness in the senses, but it's to conceive a different kind of desire, the desire to find a true happiness inside. That's not going to leave you. That's not going to change. And the realization that you haven't gotten there, he says, calls that renunciate grief. Now, renunciate grief is good because it's what gets you on the path. Because trying to find an escape from householder grief by finding householder joys ends up just in repeated disappointment. But the quest for renunciate joy, he says, starts with renunciate grief, realizing that there is a goal that can be attained, and I haven't gotten there yet. But that grief has to be accompanied by basada, conviction, confidence, that there is a way out and that you can find that way out. And you have what it takes. In other words, you take the conceit that lies at the center of grief and you point it in a new direction. There's that story where Sarabhut is talking about how he'd reflected one day after meditating, is there anything in the world? which in changing would cause grief to arise in his mind. He said, no, there's nothing. Ananda, who was listening in, immediately said, well, what about if the Buddha passed away? Wouldn't you feel grief then? And Sariputta said, no, it's reflect that it's a sad thing that someone who was so useful for the world had to pass away. But it wouldn't cause any disturbance in his mind. And Ananda's reaction is interesting. He says, ah, it's a sign that you have no more conceit. Because again, that's what the grief is. It's a, it's a wound to your sense of self, or one of your senses of self. But the cure, of course, is not to abandon conceit entirely. You can't do that right away. So you might call it renunciate conceit, reflecting that other people have found a way out and they've started out in many times situations worse than we are in terms of their strengths, in terms of their weaknesses, in terms of inner and outer qualities, inner and outer situations. But they were able to find their way out. They can do it, so can we. So you take that conceit and you put it to a good purpose. You create another sense of self, a sense of self that aims at true happiness. And this is a sense of self that you want to encourage, that you want to nourish. You develop a sense of responsibility, you develop a sense of confidence and purpose. You can begin to marshal all your different senses of self in this direction, because it's not the case that as you're on the path you can have only one desire. We live in a world, we have to deal with people, we have to deal with situations, we've got bodies we have to care for, we have to live with people, we're social animals. So there are going to be other desires as well, but you have to learn how to master them, how to marshal them and really look at them. Which desires are pulling you away from true happiness? Which ones are 
actually helpful, or at the very least not obstacles. So that right there involves a kind of shedding, shedding the desires that pull you away, and shedding those selves. This is why it's sometimes very difficult, because we have a strong identification with certain desires, certain aspirations, certain aims. And we have to reflect. If we don't let go of these things now, no matter how much we like them, no matter how, how, no matter how intimate they are. If we don't let go of them now while we're focused and mindful, they're going to be pulled away from us. Again, it's going to be like part of you has been ripped out at some time, some point in time. So you reflect on the fact that everybody has to do this. It's not just you. And that allows you to look at the whole issue of where you're finding happiness, where you're looking for happiness, from a broader perspective. And the broader perspective takes a lot of the sting away. wherever there's loss in life. You have to reflect that the important things have not been lost. That story with Ananda and Sariputta continues. It turns out that actually Sariputta died before the Buddha did. And for some reason there's a Mahayana version of the story in which the Buddha says he lost his sense of the directions. He was so upset that he would lost Sariputta and Moggallana. And it's really an insult to the Buddha. It's basically pandering to people's ideas of their, the importance of their emotions, to portray the Buddha in that way. The actual story is that Ananda was the one who was upset when he hears of Sariputta's death. He goes to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said, well, did Sariputta take virtue away? Did he take concentration away? Did he take discernment away? Did he take release away? No. All the important things in life are still there. The important possibilities, the important opportunities are still there. And again, as the Buddha said, did I, ever, did I ever tell you that there are some things in life that will never leave you? Things that are born, things that age, things that grow ill, do you think they'll never leave you? And then it says no. But there's one thing in life that will not leave you, and that's release. I've told you many times that story of a John Sawat, but it bears retelling. My last visit to him before he passed away. He had suffered brain damage in an accident. And he said, you know, my brain is telling me all kinds of weird things, all kinds of weird perceptions are coming up. But at the very least he had the mindfulness to recognize them as weird. And then he added, but that thing I got from my meditation, that hasn't left. That's something you can depend upon. And so you want to develop the desire to find that. Nourish that desire, nourish whatever sense of self is skillful in pursuing that desire. Ultimately, you have to let that self go too, but in the meantime, it's going to get you where you want to go. Like that raft across the river. I mean, once you've crossed the river, you're not going to need the raft anymore. Everybody knows that part of the story. But people tend to forget that while you're crossing the river, you're going to need the raft. You're going to need everything from right view on through right concentration. And all these things require a sense of self that's strong, competent, willing to learn from mistakes, focused on doing what's skillful. 
learning to recognize what's not, admitting when you've made a mistake, and wanting to learn from it. So your skill can grow more solid. That may seem like a faraway goal. That's renunciate grief, realizing that this may take time and it takes energy. But it's time and energy well spent. When you think of all the time and energy that has been wasted in your life, in your many lifetimes, it shouldn't seem too much to put energy into this goal. That doesn't lead to disappointment. That doesn't lead to loss. It's the one thing that when you attain it and you have to let go of the sense of self that got there, you don't let go of it with regret. You let go of joy.